afternoon is from Professor Stephen Saucer, who's a professor of neurological genetics at the University of Cambridge and also an honorary consultant neurologist at Addenbrooke's. And he's going to talk to us today about the genetic determinants of disease outcome in MS. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for in including basic science in this very pragmatic program. I'm afraid most of what I'm going to say isn't going to be immediately translatable, but hopefully I convince you that eventually this information will be really relevant. And I've been in uh, complex genetics of MS for almost 30 years, and this is definitely the most exciting thing that we've discovered so far. So you might, you might not think it, but I do. <laughs> Trust me, I do. <laughs> okay, so I, I haven't got any disclosures. Okay, so if we were right back to the beginning, so, so the, the epidemiology of MS has been studied for over 100 years. Neurologists are typically obsessional characters, so despite the fact that there's 10 studies out there showing that, they feel that they need to do an 11th or a 12th or whatever. So there really is a wealth of epidemiological data about MS. And you can sort of boil it down to two things. One is that the disease varies in frequency across the world. So there are certain parts of the world where the disease is very common, and there are other parts of the world where the disease is very rare. So that immediately suggests environmental effects. The logical explanation for that would be some environmental exposure, some virus, some toxins, some dietary things, some weather-related thing. But of course, people's genetic makeup also varies across the world. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's environmental. And then the next thing that you notice in these epidemiological studies is that um, the disease clusters in families. So we all recognize that. When we see people in the clinic, it's sort of, you know, 15 to 16 percent of patients will give a family history of the disease, far more than you'd expect for a disease that has a prevalence of about one in a thousand. So it's very common for them to say, oh, my, my grandfather or my, my, my aunt had MS. We, we all know that. So, but again, just because it clusters in families, although that suggests genetic factors, doesn't mean that that's necessarily the case because families tend to eat the same things, they're exposed to the same climate, so they share environmental factors as well. So both of these, these uh, details suggest the importance of environmental and genetic factors, but you need more uh, specific studies in, in order to try and work out the relevant contributions, at least in terms of the familial clustering. So the classic study, of course, is to look at twins, to look at identical twins who share 100% genetics and probably have the same amount of environmental sharing as dizygotic twins who only share half as much genetics. And you see a much higher concordance rate. So if your identical twin has got MS, then your chance of getting MS is about one in three. If your non-identical twin has MS, then the chances of you getting MS is about the same as any other brother or sister who might, might have MS. So that rather implies that genetics are having an important part to play. So another thing you can do is you can look at individuals who were adopted at an early age, because they have two families. They have a family that they've shared environment with, and they have a family that they've shared genetics with. So what you see is an excess risk of MS in the genetically related family and no excess risk. In the, in the family with whom they've shared environment. <coughs> Another thing you can say is, is, does this happen more often than you'd expect by chance, so-called conjugal pairs? Are both husband and wife having MS more often than you'd expect by chance? Now, of course, this is not an easy study to do because you have to allow for people meeting through meetings like this and the MS society or whatever. But if you make all those corrections, there's no actual excess of uh, conjugal pairs above what you'd expect by chance, but the risk to their offspring is substantially greater. So if both your parents have MS, if there's MS on both sides of your family, then the risk to the offspring is much higher than if there's only MS on one side of the family. You can look at different types of siblings. So half siblings have about half the risk, and step siblings have no risk. So if you put all of this together, what it tells you is that it, it doesn't really matter if you live with someone who has MS, if you are married to somebody or live with somebody who subsequently develops MS, unless you're genetically related to that person. The more closely genetically related you are to someone with MS, then the higher your risk of getting MS. But it's still the case that most people are not going to get MS just because a relative has MS. 
This is not to imply that there are no environmental factors, because they didn't do this study by migrating people from one country to another. These were all within Canada. So they're all eating the same sorts of diets. There's not so much difference between one Canadian family and the next. So it's telling you that the sort of micro differences between one family and another probably don't play a big part. But we know from migration studies that there are big population level differences. If you move from a high risk area to a low risk area, your risk will go down and vice versa. So there definitely are environmental factors. The take home message from this many years of work is that there are definitely genetic factors that influence whether or not you're going to get MS. So what's the difficulty with finding those? Well, as we know, the, your DNA, your genetic code, is made up of these four chemicals, which we code as A, C, G, and T, and they're just strung together in a long list. There's, there's three billion of them, so we don't have anything in ordinary experience that's three billion. You know, we, we can't really conceptualize that. It's just another naught on the end of, of, of a long series of noughts. So if you come to Cambridge, it's very nice to go down the punting, down the backs, and you'll see lots of architecture. This is the Wren, the Wren Library at Trinity College. So inside that, there is stack after stack after stack with shelf after shelf after shelf of books. There's about 10,000 books, and assuming sort of 50, 60,000 words per book, it's, it's about six, 600 million words, about 3 billion letters. So in other words, the Wren Library contains the same number of base pairs as you were given from your mother, and then you were given another copy of the library from your father. It is very long. And those are copied out. It's copied out and then given to you. And of course, occasionally there are mistakes. So occasionally that sequence contains an error. That's a difference. So if I take myself and I compare myself with Harry, then we will be the same. Everything apart from maybe one in a thousand base pairs will all be different. So if we looked at one of those spots where we were different, and let's say I was a T, and Harry was a C, then we could type everybody else in the room, and we might find that I'm the only T, that everybody else is a C. Or we might find at another site where I'm an A and, and Harry is a T, we might find that some people are A's and some people are T's. It's, it's a common variant or it's a rare variant. Yeah. So the, the, the challenge is to find the relevant spelling mistakes. Some of those spelling mistakes, some of those differences in the sequence, influence your risk of getting MS. How can we find those differences? So there's a sort of difference. This is the sequence at this spot. I'm a T, and Harry's a G. We've looked at large numbers of patients over many years. Many people in this room will have collected samples for us to contribute to the UK part of the, this big international effort to try and find the risk factors that influence whether or not you're going to get MS. And we've got so far about 230 of them. And these seem to be very active in immune-related cells, as you would expect. Yeah? And you could say, well, you don't, it's, it's all very well and good, but you haven't given anything back. You haven't, what have you learned from all of this? That, and the problem is, of course, we already knew the answer. We already knew that MS was an immune disease. If we had not known anything about MS and we'd done this study, it would immediately have told us that MS was an autoimmune disease and that we should treat it with anti-inflammatory treatments. But we actually already know that. So now we're just looking for mechanisms that might guide, uh, enable us to stratify patients or to, to, to guide treatment in some way. What's a more important question if you've got MS is, am I going to do well or am I going to do badly? And we all know it's a very, very common question in the clinic. Once patients have grasped the idea that they've got MS, they come and they say, what type of MS have I got? because they've looked it up on the internet and they've been told that there's primary progressive, there's relapse remitting, there's secondary progressive, etc. And they want to know which of these boxes they fall into. Now, these were descriptors. They were inventions from a few years back in the early 1990s when they were trying to pre prepare the world for trials that would work by trying to keep people who had a similar clinical course, but they'd become embodied in the sort of mythology of MS now, and people think of them as different things. If you've got primary progressive MS, it's different from having relapse rate. That's a different disease. That is not the case. The reality is, as early treatments have shown us, that everyone with MS has some level of activity, by which I mean relapses, episodes of inflammation. So some patients can have very, very few, 
and others can have very, very many. And of course, when we talk about the words activity, we're talking about those inflammatory episodes. But when you talk to patients, they think that means symptoms. So they don't understand always, do they, when you say, you're, it's okay, your disease is inactive, and they're thinking, well, it doesn't feel inactive. It feels really active. Yeah, they, it, it's not the same thing as symptoms. So people can vary in how much relapse activity they're having from nothing to many, many, or highly frequent. They can also vary in how, um, how much degeneration, how much irreversible disability they accumulate. Are they, are they heading towards lots of brain volume loss, where they have lots of accumulated irreversible uh, uh, disability from damage to the nervous system, or in fact, are they stable? Now, when I first started, we all thought that those two axes were on top of each other, and that the damage to the nervous system was purely a consequence of the inflammatory episodes. And if you stopped the inflammatory episodes, you would stop the damage. And as the new treatments came online, and particularly the more effective ones, it became very clear that that's not the case. They're not completely independent, of course. They are dependent. But actually, you can suppress the activity in somebody. You can suppress their relapse activity, and they can still progress. So these are two dimensions of the, of, of the experience of MS, two dimensions of, the, of MS, relapse activity and neurodegeneration. So obviously, most patients start off over here. When they're young, they start off with lots of relapses and not much progression. And then with the passage of time, relapses tend to become less and less frequent as the disease evolves, and progression becomes more and more evident. So people move from relapse remitting to secondary progressive. Some people have never have any apparent episodes, although when you scan them, their heads are still full of lesions. And if you watch them with time, many of them go on and have a relapse. And if you ask hard enough, loads of them have had a relapse that got missed. Yeah? But pe people who stay on this line are labelled as, as primary progressive, as though somehow that's a different disease. So I want to emphasise, these are just different dimensions of the disease. These categories, these descriptors of clinical course were pure inventions to enable clinical trials. They are not separate conditions. There is nothing different about those other than that where you are on that axis. So the next problem that you have to overcome is how are we going to measure this and it proves to be rather difficult. So again, this was invented you know, a long time ago um, when there was a need to sort of be able to quantify the amount of disability. And it's, again, become embedded in MS now. And it's not possible to do a trial or any sort of assessment where you, you can't really refer back to the EDSS. We're all familiar with the EDSS, a, a 0 to 10 scale with increasing disability. So I want to know. What are the genetic factors that influence that uh, amount of progression? Does people just randomly, some people progress quickly, some people progress slowly? Or are there genetic determinants that decide whether someone's going to have a lot of progression or a little progression? I can't just compare people who have mild disease with people who have severe disease because we know the disease tends to get worse as you get older. So all I'd end up doing is comparing 20-year-olds who've had one bout of optic neuritis with 60-year-olds who were in a 70-year-olds who were in a wheelchair. Yeah, that's not, I've got to allow for age in some way. And it proves to be a little bit more difficult than you'd expect. And we invented this thing called the multiple sclerosis severity score, and we updated it to uh, allow for the, um, the, the age-related multiple sclerosis severity score because we recognize from the natural history studies that people reach these disability milestones at particular ages. So the average patient starts to have significant disability when they're in the mid-40s. They start to need a, wheel, a, a walking stick when they're in the mid-50s, and they're in a wheelchair when they're in the mid-60s. That's the average patient. We all know many examples that have done worse or better, but that's the average. And it's surprisingly consistent. So this, these natural history studies predate any sort of treatment. This is what happened to untreated MS patients. Yeah? They, on average, tend to reach these points in, the, in their disease at set ages. So we in, included that here. And so if you think of somebody who's had the disease for 10 years, 
Some of them will have got to EDSS 5, some of them will have got to EDS 8, some of them will be at EDSS 1, and we just calculate this number, how they compare to everybody else who's had the disease for the same length of time. So you take everybody who's had, who's had the disease for this length of time and you compare them, and we can do that with, on the basis of age or uh, duration of disease. So that's how we're going to measure severity. That's the, the, the sort of most robust way we have, but it's, it's got lots of problems. We know it takes sort of years to go from here to there, but then you can see that this is not such a, a big distance. There's many more points traveled on the scale here to go from there to there than there are to go from here to here. Yeah, so it's, it's non-linear. Okay. So in order to get enough patients, because we know that the genetic effects, it's not like if you get this bad genotype, it causes the disease. It's not like cystic fibrosis. If you have that genotype, you get cystic fibrosis. If you don't have that genotype, you don't get cystic fibrosis. That's a sort of black and white. This is a small contributor. If you've got this genotype, it slightly increases your risk. If you don't have it, it slightly reduces the risk. So we need thousands of patients in order to be able to detect these signals. So that means an international collaboration funded through uh, the UK and America and through Europe. Um, these are many of my colleagues, there have been many hundreds more, and, and indeed many of you in the room will have contributed to this. You will have helped us to collect DNA over the years, because it's taken years to get 12,000 patients with sufficiently high quality outcome data to be able to do this. And we, we did one of these genotyping chips, which means we looked at 7.8 million, so almost 8 million of these spelling mistakes across the genome we were able to look at in these 12. So that's 100 billion data points. Yeah? It's a non-trivial exercise. Now, each one of those little data points, each one of those little spelling mistakes, differs in different parts of the world. So here's an example. Here's one. And it turns out that the, the, the tealil is not so common in Scandinavia as it is in Italy. So each one of these little, each time we type somebody, if you happen to carry a T, that rather suggests that you've got a little bit of Southern European ancestry, but not by very much per snip. But if you've done 8 million of them, each one gives you a little piece of information. So using that, this is the 12,000 individuals, and each dot is coloured according to the country they were recruited in. And then what's shown on the axes is the sort of cumulative effect of how closely related they are in terms of uh, allele frequencies. And surprise, surprise, you can walk through Europe genetically. Yeah. So you can start in Scandinavia, and you can work your way down into the low countries, into Central Europe, and then down into Southern Europe. So it maps out. What does this tell you? What it means is people don't walk very far before they find a mate. <laughs> <laughs> they do not randomly mate across Europe. Yeah? So, and that's, a, that's history portrayed there for you. But this is the biggest confounder. If I want to know that this A allele is more frequent in MS than in controls, or more frequent in severe MS than in mild MS, then uh, you know, what's the main thing that determines whether I carry an A allele? It's, it's whether my parents carried an A allele. It's my ancestry. So I need to correct for this. This is the major confounder in genetic analysis. But we can measure it because we've done so many tests. We can measure it with extreme precision and correct for it. So we can balance out any distorting effects that might come from people having uh, an unusual ancestry. Okay, so this is the result of the study. So this is what's called a Manhattan plot. So this is the genome along the bottom here, lined up from chromosome 1, chromosome 22. And what's shown on this axis is minus log of the p-value. So the higher up the dot is, the more significantly associated it is. So this is the sort of what we call the genome-wide significance level. So you wouldn't expect to see any dots go above that level just by chance. So if you buy 8 million lottery tickets, you have a much better chance of winning the lottery than if you just buy one. Yeah? So you have to allow for the fact that you bought 8 million lottery tickets, and that's what that dotted line does. And you can see that we got this SNP above the line and several SNPs quite close to the line. So these are genetic variants that are far more frequent in severe patients than they are in mild patients. Statistically significantly more than you would expect just by chance. Just because you've tested 8 million, 
you wouldn't expect to see that level of difference. <coughs> Still unhappy with that, we found another nearly 10,000 patients and checked those SNPs, those top 10 SNPs, in that second completely independent, uh, um, <coughs> nearly 10,000 people. And the, the strongest one also showed association in that cohort. It's quite a common variant, so 20%. So quite a lot of people in the room carry that variant. This variant is not so common, only 1%. So maybe there's one or two people in the room who carry that, that variant. Those two replicated. So how much of the variation in severity can we attribute to the genetics that we've tested so far, the common variants that we've tested? And the answer is about 13%. So some people do well and some people do badly. The genes that I, the, the analysis I've just shown you accounts for about 13% of that difference. Yeah. So a fairly sub, sub, uh, substantial amount. It's not as much as we know for risk of the disease, but rather more than we know for other diseases, yeah? where genetics play a part, but not, not quite such a part. <coughs> so there are other ways to look at outcome rather than just the, the, the ARM score, rather than just the age-adjusted EDSS and saying... You know, if you've got this SNP, you have a worse EDSS. Some of the patients, about 8,000 of them, had multiple measures of EDSS. So they had EDSS measured at multiple times. So you can look at additional things. You can look at the time to confirm disability worsening, the time to requiring a walking stick, the time to EDSS 6, or how quickly your EDSS changes over time. I think this is probably the easiest one to interpret. If you're a homozygote, if both copies, if you've got both of your chromosomes carrying the bad allele, then you end up needing a walking stick about 3.7 years <coughs> compared to people who don't carry that risk allele. So to put that in perspective, the risk sharing scheme showed us that patients treated with beta interferon and glutamia slows their time to getting, needing a walking stick by about four years. So this genetic variant is about the same effect as taking beta interferon. Yeah. So it's not a trivial effect. It's only one SNP. It's the tip of an iceberg. It is not counting for much of the 13%. The 13% comes from all the other things that are showing a little bit of association. Okay. Looking at the other, the other variant, because it's so frequent, we can't do the three genotypes because we only had one person who was a homozygote for the, for the rare allele. But again, it's it, carrying that bad allele means that you end up needing a walking stick about two years earlier. So what are the genes across the genome? You know, what are the genes that are, are uh, being implicated? So one way to look at that is to, is to look and see which genes are used in all the different tissues. So there's been very extensive efforts internationally to try and define what are the genes that are important in skin? What are the genes that are important in ovary? What are the genes that are important in in this or that tissue. And then we can compare those genes, those lists of genes for different tissues, with our results from our GWAS, from our study, to see these are the genes we found that are relevant in MS. Are they this, what, which tissue are they coming from? So if you do that for susceptibility, if you do that for risk, it's overwhelmingly the immune system. So you see all the genes that are implicated by your findings in uh, uh, the susceptibility GWAS are all immune genes. They're genes in your B cells, they're genes in your T cells, etc. If you do that for severity, then you get the nervous system. I think this is probably the strong, if you weren't convinced by anything, this is really hard to explain. Why would the target tissue be the enriched tissue in this study if this was just noise? Yeah, I think it's really hard. This is telling you that the genes that influence outcome are, are manifesting themselves within the nervous system rather than within the immune system or some other tissue. So if you zoom in on that Manhattan plot, if you zoom in to that little bit of chromosome 2 where you have your most associated SNP, then look and see which genes are in the region. Because that's obviously, those are the best candidates. It's not proof that they're the relevant genes. But these two genes, one this side and one that side, are the closest genes to the most associated genetic change. So this is a gene called dysferlin, and this is a zinc finger transcription factor. So when I did this, 
I was pretty depressed, yeah? because dysferlin is a muscle gene. Yeah? So if you mutate dysferlin, you get a, a sort of muscular dystrophy. You get a limb girdle muscular dystrophy, or you get wasting in your lower limbs called my myoshi myopathy. Very rare, very few cases of this, uh, this condition. And I thought, oh, that's a bit sad. We'll have to think about the other genes. But then one of my PhD students did a little bit more searching, and she discovered that actually, this isn't part of the mechanism that deals with motor contraction, which is what Duchenne is all about. This gene actually is important in membrane repair. So if you think of a muscle working, it's going to tear membrane all the time. So it's going to be very important that you can repair that. And what is myelin made of? It's wrapped up you know, membrane. It's, the brain is like stuffed full of membrane. When you get inflammation, there will be stretching of the tissues. There will be release of free radicals. Membrane will be extensively damaged. So some influence on a, on a system that deals with membrane repair that enables you to repair damage. This dysferlin gene is critically important in the mechanism of membrane repair. So all of a sudden, interest spiked again. Yeah? And the assumption that just because it was a muscle gene so before you ask, it's so rare there's nobody with MS who's got this muscle condition as well. If they did have it, they would do very badly, would be the prediction. What about the gene, the other side? So thinking about that one, just to take a step to the side for a moment. So retroviruses. So HIV is a retrovirus. It's an RNA virus. It sticks on the surface of a cell. It gets inside. And then what happens is what's called reverse transcription. So the RNA is turned into a piece of DNA, and then that DNA gets stuck inside your own genome. Now, that's fine if it happens in, well, not fine, but you know, it, it doesn't have any immortal effects in a skin cell. But if that happens in an egg cell, or that happens in a sperm cell, then that retrovirus can now be transmitted to the next generation. Yeah? That has become part of your genome. So this has been happening for millions of years. So we have many, many retroviruses in our, gene, in our genome. The human genome has about 8% of it is endogenous retroviruses that at some point made their way into our genome and have become part of our genome. Some of those have been mutated into useful genes, and others of them sit there in fairly dormant states as far as we know, but sometimes they can be activated. And the thing that can activate them is Epstein-Barr virus. So it turns out that Epstein-Barr virus can activate endogenous retrovirus. And that's one of the theories about how EBV might contribute to MS. So this zinc finger protein, which is also known as NP220, is the main uh, link for what's called HUSH, the complex that controls and suppresses endogenous retroviruses. So throughout the genome, this transcription factor binds and suppresses the adverse influences of endogenous retroviruses. So you can imagine that if you had a defective suppression of endogenous retroviruses and then you got EBV, it might revolt, result in more activation. So actually, these two seemingly uninteresting genes turned out both to have really exciting possible mechanisms by which they might be relevant in MS, one through membrane repair and the other through the, the, the control of genomic parasites. Essentially, these retroviruses are like parasites in our, in our genome. So what else did we look at? Well, the, the obvious thing to do is, is what's called Mendelian randomization. So you can do a cheat. So you can, because there are, we know the genetic factors that influence vitamin D. We know the genetic factors that influence obesity. We know the genetic factors that influence smoking. We can ask, are those genetic factors more associated with outcome than they should be by chance? Because if they are, that implies that those exposures are important in the development of severity. So nothing for vitamin D, nothing for obesity. Smoking, if you smoke, you will progress more quickly. The genetic factors that predispose you to smoking predispose you to doing badly. That's what we tell patients, that you best stop smoking. Yeah? So this is sort of genetic proof for the advice that we all give to patients that they should stop, they should stop smoking. So the interesting one was 
the, a protective effect of years of education. So the more highly, the more years you had spent in education, the less you, less severe your course, your MS ran. So this is sort of the percentile of education from the person with the least education to the group with the most education, and this is their average score. And you can see it's not a big effect, but it's a small effect. And you might say, oh, well, that, that might be because, you know, socioeconomic. People who, who are rich get lots of education, and therefore they get lots of medical treatment and stuff. But if you correct for socioeconomic status as best as we could, the effect is, is still there. So do, you know, another attempt we made to sort of try and understand what we'd found was we looked in the... Uh, the Netherlands Brain Bank, where they have nearly 300 brains, that they had already quantified the amount of in, immune activity, the amount of uh, MS damage in the cortex and in the brainstem. And when we genotyped those 300 for the, for the associated SNP, we found that people with the bad genotype had far more damage in their cortex, far more damage in their brainstem, had a shorter course because they died more quickly. So that's only 300 people. It's a miracle that we would see this effect in just such a small number of people. <coughs> so if you put this all together, it's sort of telling you that whether you do well or badly depends on how robust your immune system, how robust your brain is to the inflammatory insult. Yeah? Can your brain survive the damaging effects of the inflammation? telling you that CNS-expressed genes that promote membrane repair and protection from damaging effects of, uh, of retroviruses are relevant. So there, there were clinical clues to that. So this is just to remind you, even in the very, very early stages of MS, even in the very, every time there is a relapse or any sort of inflammatory activity, there is damage to the nervous system. So this is a, an axon that's been transected because of MS, and there's ballooning of the contents of the axon. That's a, a membrane event. Yeah? So every time there's, and we know from studies that patients have already started to lose neurons more quickly than others before the diagnosis is made. Yeah, so progression is occurring right from the start of MS. So this is a, con a hereditary condition called labus hereditary optic neuropathy. It's a mitochondrial DNA damage. If you have that as a woman, probably you'll be okay. 50-50, you'll go through life without going blind. If you're a man and you have it, then about 90% of people will go blind because of that mutation. Now, if by chance you get MS, then these are the patients who get optic neuritis and they don't recover. So normally we see patients with optic neuritis, it's bad for a time, and then for most of them, it gets back to the point where they're not really suffering any disability. But some patients are left blind because it, if you carry this mutation, it increases the penetrance. So if you've got a weakness in your nervous system, it exposes it by having MS. So this is another condition. Um, so this is a common genetic variant that causes motor neurone disease. So if you carry that, chances are that mutation won't be penetrant until you're 70, 80. But we have seen cases where people have developed MS and then it's come much earlier. So we had a 30-year-old woman who developed absolutely typical MS and then on top of that had motor neurone disease because she carried this mutation. So MS and motor neurone disease. Yeah. So there are other mutations that are, are the same. Yeah. So, so I've just shown you, I, I mean, 230 variants we found, and we haven't made much progress in understanding them because we already knew the answer. Now we've got two variants, and they're pointing towards mechanisms in an area where we have no idea. Yeah. So these are worthy mechanisms for further attention. It may well be that we can develop treatments that help to control endogenous retroviruses or that promote membrane repair and will improve the prognosis for patients with MS. It won't control the disease, it won't stop the disease, but it'll stop the bad effects of the disease. It's a very large international study. Um, that variant is quite a substantial effect. It's about four years worth, uh, four years earlier to, to need a walking stick. 
And it, it, it seems as though whether you get MS or don't get MS depends on the state of your immune system. Whether you do well or badly depends on how well your nervous system can cope with that insult. If you've got genetic weaknesses like labors or C9-ORF72 or whatever, then that will expose those. And there are probably other, like the membrane repair or the hush, that increase the risk of your, ner your nervous system not being able to tolerate MS. Thanks.